Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. So last week, Adam, I was at a security conference in Atlanta called the Experts Conference, or TEC, Tech. And it's hosted by Quest. It's honestly one of the best Microsoft-centric security conferences that I've ever been to. And highly recommend anyone who is a Microsoft customer to take a look at it. Even though it's hosted by Quest, they don't really like shove their product down your throat. Every session that I was there was hosted by a Microsoft MVP or internal Microsoft people. One of the keynote speakers was Alex Weinhart, which we talk about all the time on the show. And it was honestly really, really good. So take a look at that. But while I was there, I attended a talk that was hosted by Trimark Security, who is founded by uh, Sean Metcalf. And he gave the talk, and he's like an AD master. He did a session on protecting service principles and hybrid accounts and AD security. And if you remember Christina Marillo, who is a friend of the pod, she actually was hired by Sean to work at Trimark, so that's where she's working today. But I thought we'd go through something that they allu- that they mentioned in that talk, which was a webcast white paper that was put out, which was some of his discussion about AD security. And we haven't done any podcast episodes on AD security since our very first year, like episode nine. And so I thought it'd be really good to go through this. We had some emails come through asking about AD security. So let's go through this white paper. I highly recommend that you look through it yourself. I'm going to go through the high level tips today but the white paper is going to have a link in the show notes and highly recommend that you go through it yourself if you're wanting to learn about how to secure your active directory so the very first tip is password policy and i know that we talk about passwords quite a bit actually recently we talked about passwords with kerberostable accounts but a lot of ad environments are still using that legacy eight character password and in the white paper it'll actually show you one of the charts that adam and i saw last week and the week before which was using today's gpus an eight character password can be cracked in under an hour so you should migrate to 12 characters or plus as soon as possible for all your accounts and all your users At 14 characters, just an FYI, if you're looking at this chart, even if you just use all lowercase characters, it'll take four years to crack. So imagine switching to 12 plus. I mean, it'll take a much longer time to crack those passwords. Um, Also, in some older AD environments, if you've been around for a while and you're AD environment is fairly old, you might be storing LM hashes, which are less secure than NT hashes. And LM hashes can be cracked using a rainbow table in just a couple of seconds. So if you're using passwords more than 14 characters, by default, those LM hashes aren't stored. And you can also prevent LM hashes from being stored via GPO. Something that I learned, which was really interesting, that I actually didn't know before, was that Using group policy, you can only require up to 14 characters to be mandated. Of course, you can always set longer passwords, but require is only up to 14 using GPO. In order to get more than 14, say 15 plus, to be required, you have to use what's called fine grain policy uh, password policies. And so one of the recommendations is to move to fine grain policy, password policies for your admin accounts and for any non-human service accounts, which means you have to target like a security group with this password policy 
And then anyone in that security group would have to set something higher than that. So very different than being able to set a long password versus requiring a 15 plus character password. So you got to use these fine grain password policies in order to do that. Um, and that does require all of your DCs to be server 2012 or above. If you want to do it via the GUI, you can do it via PowerShell for server 2008, but you should be migrating off 2008 pretty soon. So um, recommend to do that for your admins and service accounts first. And then if you want to, of course, you can always target the entire org after that to go 15 plus, but at least move to 12 plus for everyone. And then admins and non-human service accounts should be required 15 plus. And then the final thing is we've talked about this before, but password protection. If you're in an Azure, you know, M365, uh, E3 or EMS E3 or AADP1 customer, you have password protection that is included with that. That gives you those custom password lists as well as the comparison with compromised passwords. And you can integrate that with your on-prem AD environment when users are setting or um, uh, or resetting their passwords. So password complexity, frequent subject on this show, and certainly adding more characters is really helpful. One thing Andy said that I thought was interesting is he mentioned that even if you have a 14-character, all lowercase passwords, so one character set, just lowercase letters, that's still four years, which is pretty much sufficient, right? Um, And then if you would add at least an uppercase character set as well, now you're even longer. So... Point being, my recommendation, and this kind of aligns to a lot of password guidance given, is you're better off increasing length but removing complexity requirements when you do that. So you can actually make this a user education thing and say something like, we're moving away from passwords and we're moving to pass phrases. And we're going to get rid of all the complexity requirements with numbers and symbols and all that. But instead, we're going to ask you to make it longer. So you can make it a phrase or a couple of words or whatever. Um but that that's actually going to deliver better security overall than eight characters with all the character set complexity and honestly probably make easier passwords to remember too. So very, very helpful here. And then as long as I'm on my soapbox, password expiration doesn't help with any of this because password expiration at its core is a control only against um, when an attacker already has compromised credentials. You know, if you haven't compromised them yet, then changing it delivers no security benefit. And if they already do have it, you're probably too wait late to wait for a password change interval for to deliver meaningful protection because unless you nailed it just right to where the attacker compromised the password two days before it expired and blast when that expired and changed, you caught them, you know, normally that is not actually a meaningful um, requirement. So you can do everything Andy's talking about, but you could take this as an opportunity to kind of communicate and and change how you approach passwords in your organization. And then one other call out, Andy, you mentioned Azure AD password protection, which is a really beneficial thing from the perspective of blocking known bad passwords, like banned password lists. Even if you don't have an Azure AD premium subscription at all, if you don't subscribe to any M365 services and you just have Azure AD like the free edition, you can still use this. Um, You won't be able to set your own custom band password list. However, you still get the Azure AD top 50, top 100, whatever it is, most commonly used bad bad passwords and it will ban them from being used in your Active Directory environment as well, which is still a helpful control because you have that global scale and you're at least getting the worst of the worst out of there. But it's even better if you do have Azure AD Premium like EMS E3, M365 E3, because then you can set those custom banned password lists for things like common sports teams or common words in your local area. 
So some good things there to kind of modernize your, your password security while at the same time reducing your attack surface. So that's kind of win-win. The second tip is admin hygiene. And so if you don't have a good way of reviewing your AD admins and or aren't doing it regularly, this is something you should do as soon as possible, whether it's through PowerShell scripts, manually through, you know, a duct, or you have a third party tool to do it. Um, you're going to want to review who's in the domain admins group regularly, as well as enterprise admins. If you don't have multiple forests, then you shouldn't need anyone in the enterprise admins on a daily basis. So for companies with multiple forests, then and if you're having to actually manage different forests using the enterprise admin, then maybe, but if you just have one forest, then you should just elevate it when you actually need it and then remove it when necessary. Um, another one is account operators. That's a built-in um, role in active directory. And it has a lot of permissions. A lot of people use account operators for their help desk. And honestly, I think that's a little over permissioned. And so you should look at custom delegations for your help desk and go through what they actually need and expand if you know they don't have enough. How I did it at my previous company was I scoped what I thought they needed and let them roll with it. It was pretty restrictive. And then they'd come across something that they couldn't do. And I would reevaluate, give that permission specifically and keep on going until they had everything that they needed on a daily basis. And it was less than what was granted through account operators. You should also look at accounts with uh, the flag password never expires. Most likely if you have a legacy AD, there's going to be accounts there with eight characters um, or maybe even less. Um, password protection, like we mentioned, only works on password sets and changes. So if you have accounts that are never expire, at least change the password so that it is longer and goes, you know, um, will be compliant with the password protection policies that you have in place. And you should remove stale admin accounts. There is probably people in that group that haven't used their permissions in a really long time you should remove them. If they're not actually administrating Active Directory, there's no reason for them to be a domain admin. You know, you can scope different permissions, delegate different permissions if they need like certain things like a password change, right? You don't need to be a domain admin to change somebody's password. Um, also look at the service accounts that have domain admin privileges. Contact the vendor if there's a specific tool that you see in there that needs it. When I did this review at my previous company, uh, there were at least a handful of domain admins that were removed, right? Like you shouldn't have 15 domain admin accounts in, in reality. I would treat it the same as global admin. Global admin gets flagged if you have five or, or more than five, right? So review those stale accounts, check to see when the last time they were used. And if they're not being used, remove them. This one is also something that I learned, um, restricting domain join. Now, by default, any authenticated user can join up to 10 machines to Active Directory. I didn't think that was a big deal, but what I learned was when a regular user creates a computer account in AD, they're set as the owner of that object. And so that means that S several rights on the computer account are assigned to the user, including the ability to modify computer attributes and read extended attributes. So this can be a way for attackers to do reconnaissance of your environment by joining a device to Active Directory. So if you don't have that need, you can restrict it to like your help desk folks or a couple of service accounts like SCCM to just do that join and then remove it from any other user to do that. This is one I didn't know just because at least the orgs I worked at already had this buttoned up. They always had it configured so that you had to be some sort of administrator to do a domain join. So I assumed that was normal behavior. 
Uh, I learned that it's not on the, the podcast just now, which is really interesting. But I think this is one of those AD hygiene things, security things that I think most orgs are buttoned up on because this has generally been my experience as someone who worked in corporate IT for years and years. Like I knew normal user accounts couldn't domain join in almost any place I've ever been. So they got it right. You should also review accounts with unrestrained delegation and remove any without SPNs. And so I didn't know this as well. This is something I learned from reading the white paper. Unconstrained delegation is one of the oldest and least secure form of Kerberos delegation. And it can be used to impersonate any account, including AD admin and domain controllers, if they're not protected properly. So in this white paper, it's actually really good. It goes through what you need to do or or what it is that the action is, why you need to do it, and then it actually walks you through how to do it, whether it's with PowerShell scripts or um, a PowerShell commandlet. There's actually scripts that Trimark provides for free to do some of the actions that they're talking about. So if this hits like a nerve and you're like, oh, I should probably do this, I don't know about it, read through the white paper, walk through the steps, and at least do the reconnaissance because a lot of them are just like let's look for accounts with unrestrained delegation and maybe you run that p commandlet and you don't have any great let's move on right most likely you're probably not going to grant any accounts going forward with it if you don't have any already but if you're in a very legacy environment you might have some so you should review those and remove them you can also protect ad admins from kerberos delegation so there's two ways to protect AD user accounts from either inadvertently or maliciously delegated for Kerberos authentication. The first method is to set the account as sensitive and cannot be delegated. And that's a flag on the user account. When you enable this setting, it's one of the quickest wins for most Active Directory environments. When it isn't specifically protected, it can be delegated or impersonated by any form of Kerberos delegation. So setting admins accounts as sensitive is one of the few protections that you have against unconstrained delegation. It's important to note though, if they are non-human service accounts, then you, you probably shouldn't set this for those service accounts because setting a non-human service account could break the service if you're set, setting it to, to sensitive. So take a look at that. But user accounts certainly can do that. And then protected users. This was something that we have mentioned way, way back in the day. And it was also something that I learned um, looking through AD security that I didn't previously learn before. But there is a built-in group in Active Directory called protected users. Now, be careful. You should test this and roll it out in phases, but it is very, very beneficial to add your admins to the protected users group because you'll gain some protections. Number one, the plain text credentials are not cached. So if those users are logging into machines, they're not going to be cached. And that's one of the easiest ways for attackers to escalate privileges or, you know, mm -hmm. laterally move all that stuff. Right. So by default, anyone in the protected users groups are not going to have their credentials cached. Um, their NT one, one way function is also not cached. The Kerberos ticket granting ticket is acquired at long on and can't be reacquired automatically. There's a whole list of, benefits to this and essentially it's for the purpose of protecting that account just in time access to log in um, there's no delegation or unconstrained delegation by default um, no ntlm authentication the tgt renewal can't be beyond four hours lifetime so there's a lot of security things but it does limit certain things that the user can do so it may affect how they're act, accessing Active Directory or ADUCT to administer certain things. So again, test this, 
but highly recommend that you move your admins to the protected user group. There is a lot here. You've seen that all spelled out. And I'm thinking back to, and it's been almost three years now since I did my certified ethical hacker training, but so many of these things you talk about and TLM and um, cached credentials and everything else. Like I think of all of those as ways to do privilege escalation or lateral movement within an environment. This is definitely something you should try to get to just reading that list, like reading that out loud. You're like, Holy smokes, that really protects your privileged accounts and eliminates so many methods that you don't have to worry about anymore. So, you know, it, it, it's hard because sometimes we talk about this theoretically in a vacuum, and I'm sure that you might roll this out or test it and discover that your admins can't do some sort of function they have to do, some sort of legacy administrative package doesn't work or something. Okay. You know, you can deal with that then, but it doesn't hurt to try and see where you're at and then kind of go from there, especially when your admin should ostensibly be technical users who can understand that stuff breaks and kind of help you work around it. So that's really, really cool. I love that. The seventh tip, so we're on number seven here actually, is to disable print spoolers on all domain controllers and any services that do not perform print services. So there was the print spooler nightmare uh, vulnerability. Uh, honestly, if you're not printing, you should just disable it. Um, I'm not sure why it's on by default anyways. Maybe Microsoft at some point thought that all servers needed to act as a print server, but for sure you don't need it on domain controllers. So disable it. Um, if you're using Microsoft threat and vulnerability management, there's always going to be a recommendation in there to disable it. You can just go in there and scope a GPO to turn it off. So uh, the eighth one is patching. Uh, probably don't need to dive too deep on it. We did a whole session on patching, but you should review any software that's installed on your domain controller, as in there shouldn't be any. So <laughs> <laughs> review that because there. Domain controllers are, are like appliances. They, they have one function, and it's to run Active Directory. And, and there shouldn't be any Notepad++ or Adobe Acrobat or anything like that installed, and, and certainly not Chrome. Like, don't install any third-party browsers. Um, you shouldn't install Azure Active Directory Connect on your domain controllers. It specifically states that in the documentation. Unless it's like a lab environment, you should run it on a different server and then also treat that as a domain controller, um, SCC and management console, anything, right? So don't run anything that you're not, that you don't need as part of Active Directory. Um, and if you have to install agents, make sure that they're updated. Like for example, a third party uh, agent or something even like first party for Microsoft, like uh, Defender for Identity has an agent that has to be installed updated on the domain controllers you can automatically update it or you can patch it at your convenience for me i always set it to automatic because then i know it's going to be updated and that's the easiest way to do it it doesn't cause any downtime especially if you have replication among multiple dcs so make sure that you're reviewing software that's on there Something else I learned is anonymous access. So apparently when Active Directory Domain Services was released with Windows Server 2000, Adam, you always talk about, you know, 20 plus years um, that mm -hmm. Active Directory has been out. Uh, it included configurations for backwards compatibility with Windows NT and other legacy operating systems. And this included a pre-compatibility, pre-compatible access group that was used for backwards compatibility with computers that are running Windows NT 4.0 or earlier. And anyone in this group has read access to all users and groups in the domain. So it would only, you should only add users in there if they're running Windows NT 4.0. <laughs> so the first thing is, let's hope you're not running any Windows NT 4.0 in your environment. You never know though. <laughs> Like XP still out there for sure. Mm -hmm. Whether or not Windows NT 4.0 is, that's I'd be 
scared <laughs> if there was. Um, but by default, this compatibility group, uh, you know, contained everyone or anonymous login. And if, if it did, any unauthenticated user could perform LDAP queries on Active Directory. So Ooh. that's pretty scary. <laughs> Um, so Same. attackers can do a lot of reconnaissance this way if you have this enabled. So check that group. It's called the pre-Windows 2000 compat- compatible access group. And there shouldn't be anyone in it. Hearing all those kind of throwback OSs, Windows 2000, Windows NT4, uh, just reminded me, total side note here. But I read a really awesome book recently, and I'm going to plug it here. Again, not paid or anything just thought it was fun and maybe our listeners would enjoy it as well it's called showstopper the breakneck race to create windows nt and the next generation at microsoft and it was written by g pascal zachary and it's available on kindle for ebook format if you prefer or you know good old paperback as well it's phenomenal i i did not know all of the inside story of how windows nt was first created and the team that had actually been brought in to do it um, with Dave Cutler coming from digital computer and, and all of the hirings he was able to make and just how it was kind of this pirate team inside of Microsoft that built basically the technology that still runs all versions of windows today, you know, 22 years later and counting. So, or sorry, windows NT came out in the nineties. So we're talking 30 years. Anyhow, it's really, really good. It's really compelling. If you consider yourself a student of computing history, Complete side note, but speaking of NT4 and Windows 2000, it's a really, really compelling book. And I think any of our listeners uh, might find it really, really interesting. Um, because I, I find it amazing that today, like in our modern computing environment, outside of Linux-based OSs like Android, uh, most commercial OSs today are either a descendant of Windows NT, so this story, or the other story is um, Next Computer. And, and next computer was acquired by Apple and the next step operating system formed the basis of Mac OS 10, which became iOS, which became iPad OS and TV OS and watch OS and all those things. So, um, this is an, this is an opportunity to hear about how something was created that runs a billion devices today. So, and, and then maybe on a future show, I'll plug a book about the history of next computer, uh, which I think is one of the most undertold stories in computing history. And that is the genesis of where everything Apple does today came from, from a software perspective. So equally as interesting, but we'll talk about that another time. So the last tip that they had in this white paper, and I'll have a couple bonuses for you afterwards, like Andy's tips, but <laughs> the last tip that, Trimark had is a top level tier zero OU, which is definitely something that I rec- recommend. Like I did this at my previous company. So you should have a tier zero OU for your critical computers, workstations, servers, as well as user accounts. And that OU should be locked down so that nobody else can have access to it that shouldn't need access to it. So like my help desk or level two you know, service folks could not access anyone who was in the server admins or even change people who are in the help desk admin. So all our back role security groups were all in this top tier um, OU. And of course you can have tier zero and tier one and, and whatnot, but for sure your domain admins, right? And probably anyone server admins, all of that should be in this tier zero one. Um, some bonus ones, something that you can work towards or at least think about is removing domain admin privileges from servers and endpoints. So what I mean by privileges are administrative privileges, local admin privileges to endpoints and servers. For sure on endpoints to me, because why does a domain admin need local admin on a, a, an endpoint, a a computer that a user is using. Most likely you have someone else outside of that working on it that probably would use it, right? So this is a concept of, you know, our back, your your administrative roles. Um, domain admins don't need local admin on an endpoint, in my opinion. Um, they probably don't need local admin on servers. 
really domain admins should just be accessing the domain controller. You shouldn't be logging into them on a daily basis. You only need to use them if you have to scope a GPO domain wide, uh, which should be very, for, you know, far <laughs> less than if you have an established environment. Um, and so uh, my previous company, we did this, we removed domain admins from endpoints because that made sense. Servers probably was a longer road to get to, but eventually you have server admin, like a server admin group that has access to local admin on servers. And then you have a help desk group that has local admin on workstations. And then your domain admins is a completely separate account that has no administrative privileges. And if you don't do this by default, of course, domain admins have local admin on everything, right? So, um, I would go ahead and remove it and are back those rules. Um, and then, of course, this was mentioned by Alex Weinhardt because he wrote the blog on it. Um, also was mentioned by several Microsoft MVPs, but I'll mention it one more time since we're talking about kind of AD security. But this is a little bit more hybrid, but you shouldn't sync your admin accounts to cloud, right? So syncing it to Azure. Um, your domain admin accounts should remain as domain and then you can have a separate id if you want to sync a separate id like maybe your server admin account to the cloud that's one thing but i would not sync your domain admin to the cloud for sure um, ideally you have separate identities that you sync up to the cloud that are just for cloud administration but certainly understand that that could get a little bit out of hand if you have like a server admin a domain admin now you have like a cloud admin account that's just syncing to the cloud and then you have your regular user admin so um it, it can get quite granular and probably confusing uh but uh, let's just start with don't sync your domain admins to the cloud <laughs> And, and the the guidance we've given on this show in the past is kind of the reverse direction. You're talking about don't take privileged accounts on premises and sync them up. The other idea is that accounts that are privileged in the cloud should not be synchronized accounts at all. Those should be cloud only accounts because that prevents compromising on-premises identity environment in some way, and then using that to move laterally and have privilege in the cloud as well. So if you keep those isolated, you've cut off that easy escalation path to cloud. And we saw a lot of this, especially with a lot of the attacks in the um, the late 2000s, which the attack group's name escapes me. Was it Hafnium or a couple of the other ones? Um, they did a lot of this, like out of the SolarWinds compromise, where they were compromising on-premises identity infrastructure like Duo, and then using that to move laterally to the cloud. So different thing, but related uh, as long as we're on the subject. I think what most organizations who are hybrid will automatically think to, especially if you have a pretty buttoned up provisioning process, being able like service tickets to come in to provision an account, a new employee, and then deprovision them when they leave is if you do just have cloud admins, that's probably outside of your normal process. Mm -hmm. And if they leave and you don't, you know, like you have one lever to turn if it's AD, right? You disable the account in AD and then you're done. But if they have, you know, admin accounts and everything like that, you disable all their admin accounts, but then you also have this cloud admin <laughs> that you have to manually go there. Mm -hmm. And if you don't turn that off, then, you know, um, and global admins, this is why you do need to limit global admin as a role. Global admins actually don't need an Office 365 license assigned to them in order to perform administrative functions. So, you know, be careful there. If you do want to build that process into disabling those cloud accounts, if they are purely cloud only. And that's been the argument customers have given me in the past to not follow that advice is that, it will add more complexity to have a separate account to manage and disable if that admin leaves and they feel like that attack surface is greater because of that risk of forgetting to disable that, then there is that risk of lateral movement. Um, of course, that's, that's kind of a privileged position to take when you haven't been through a compromise like that. 
you know, you don't have the scar tissue yet. It can't happen to you. So, you know, we'd rather place our bets here. So, you know, we know sometimes ideal is one thing and reality is another. And, and sometimes you have to balance that, right? If that is biting off too much to manage those cloud accounts, then don't do that yet. But ideally, where you get to is a place where privileged cloud accounts are totally separate. It's a goal for someday. Absolutely. So hopefully you learned something through this. This was the top 10 tips prevented by Trimark Security in the white paper, as well as a couple of bonus and then some commentary from me and Adam. But I would honestly read through this white paper and look at it it has very technical information on how to accomplish each one of these things um and so if it's in, if you're interested this piqued your interest take a look at it the link will be in the show notes um and uh go through it and that's our show for this week thanks for listening and watching our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or future topics you want us to talk about thanks we'll talk to you guys next week Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.